dilute suspension rheology of anisotropic particles. And uh, it turns out that it has a really interesting connection to uh, polymer physics. In particular, the so-called coil stretch transition that was uh, the subject of some research and a fair degree of controversy in the 70s and 80s. So I'll get there. So, uh, <clears throat> so to begin with, uh, you know, you have to worry about suspensions of uh, anisotropic particles. They're important in a wide variety of applications, and I've, I've shown some of them here. Paper manufacture, which involves cellulose fiber suspensions. And uh, you have fiber-reinforced composites, and then you have huge uh, clarifying tanks in industry where uh, you have sedimentation of anisotropic particulates. And then you have... Uh, them being important in biofluids because blood is essentially the dominant component. Uh, about 40, 45 percent by volume, I think, is are the RBCs, the red blood cells, and they dictate the rheology of blood. The sedimentation of red blood cells is also important in a diagnostic test, the ESR test, and uh, they are also important in the rheology of magma. Okay, so magma is actually a three-phase system. It consists of the silicate melt, the inorganic uh, phase, and then you have bubbles, uh, and then you have these mineral crystals. And uh, people are worried about the dependence of magma rheology on the bubble volume fraction, but it's, so this is that. But it turns out that the crystals also play an important role, and there have been recent, uh, there's been recent efforts on characterizing the rheology of uh, anisotropic suspensions, keeping this in mind. And it's because the rheology of magma decides the nature of the volcanic eruption. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, anisotropic flakes are routinely used in uh, flow visualization. And so in order to interpret the intensity patterns that you observe, you need to know the orientation distribution of the flakes, reflective flakes that are used in flows. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, there's also an interest in microfluidics, uh, the so-called uh, inertial microfluidics, where you use inertial lift forces to separate particles that flow through microfluidic channels. And the recent interest is the ability to sort out these particles based on shape. So the idea here is that each of these, so this is a microfluidic channel, and uh, they're flowing here at a Reynolds number that's not so small, so that's order 100. And so inertia is important, okay? And uh, so depending on the shape of the particle, lift forces can cause it to attain a unique equilibrium position. So uh, depending on the shape of the particle, uh, the downstream, you'll find them located, localized at a given position, and that allows uh, separation based on shape. So that's the idea. So, uh, right, so suspensions of anisotropic particles are important, and uh, we are going to look at a model anisotropic particle, the simplest model, in going away from a sphere. So that's a spheroid. Okay? So if you stretch a sphere along one axis, you get a prolate spheroid. And then uh, if you uh, flatten it, you get a pancake-shaped oblate spheroid. And this is the simplest departure because the anisotropy is characterized by a single parameter, the aspect ratio. And you can go from uh, needle-shaped objects with very large aspect ratios through a sphere to very small aspect ratio disc-shaped objects. Okay? So, uh, in, so whatever I'm going to be talking about from this point on has to do with spheroids of arbitrary aspect ratios. Okay? Right. So dilute suspension rheology has had an illustrious start. In 1906, uh, Einstein first calculated the sus viscosity of a dilute suspension of spheres. Okay? So here dilute means that the Spheres are far apart that they don't see each other, and each sphere only sees the imposed deformation, which is a shear flow. And Einstein showed that, uh, so this essentially means that I have to solve a single sphere problem, a sphere in an imposed shear flow. And uh, it turns out that um, the contribution of the spheres at this order, which is uh, an order proportional to the sphere volume fraction, is just an enhancement in the viscosity. So the viscosity of the suspension is the viscosity of the suspending fluid times this factor, 
which, is, uh, which has an enhancement proportional to the volume fraction. And that factor phi halves was what Einstein calculated. And uh, it's known as the Einstein coefficient now. So the idea is that uh, dilute suspension of spheres behaves as a Newtonian fluid, okay, with a slightly enhanced viscosity. Uh, now, of course, people have gone on to look at higher volume fractions. Uh, theoretically, it was first done by Batchelor in the 70s. And it turns out that it's much more complicated than this. But what I'll be doing in this talk is consider the same problem, but with the spheres replaced by spheroids, okay? And ask the same question. So what is the analog of the Einstein coefficient, okay? Now, since a spheroid has two dimensions, one its length and the other its diameter, I can have uh, many volume fractions. So the natural one is the so-called hydrodynamic volume fraction, and which is based on the largest length. Okay, so for a prolate spheroid, it would be the major, in both cases, it would be, it would be the major axis of the spheroid. Okay, so the idea is, so NLQ plays the role of phi, and now can I determine the Einstein coefficient, the analog of the Einstein coefficient for a dilute suspension of spheroids, okay? So in this case, it's not gonna be a number, it's gonna be a function of the aspect ratio, which is the one dimensionless parameter that I have, okay? And uh, now it turns out, as I'll show you, that this is not a straightforward problem, okay? Uh, and I'll t hopefully explain to you why, okay? Okay, so uh, you first, so remember that the, we are talking about dilute suspension, so the spheroids are far enough. So you again have a single spheroid problem, okay? How does a single spheroid behave when subject to a shear flow, okay? And this problem was solved by Jeffrey, okay? He actually looked at triaxial ellipsoids, okay? But uh, a limiting uh, version of his general result applies to axisymmetric spheroids, okay? And uh, he showed that the orientation vector of a spheroid in a simple shear flow moves along closed orbits, okay? And these are now known as Jeffrey orbits. And I've indicated them for a prolate spheroid and an oblate spheroid. So they are elliptical sh in shape, except that the ellipse is bent back so that it still lies on the unit sphere. So they are spherical ellipses, okay? And for the prolate, so the shear is going like this. So for the prolate spheroid, the Jeffrey orbits are elongated along the flow direction. That's this, this is the flow direction. That's the velocity gradient direction. So for the oblate spheroid, they're stretched along the velocity gradient direction. So you can rotate these through 90 degrees and get the trajectories for an oblate spheroid, okay? <clears throat> right, so the shape of the Jeffrey orbits actually depends on the aspect ratio, okay? So if you have a sphere, then the Jeffrey orbits are trivially circles, okay? And they get to be increasingly distorted as you go to an extreme aspect ratio. Okay, so for prolate spheroids, as I go from uh, a near sphere to a needle, you can see that they are enormously stretched, and in the limit of an infinitely slender fiber, they actually become meridians. Okay, these are the poles, so the intersection of this unit sphere with the flow direction are the two poles, and the Jeffrey orbits are the meridians connecting those two poles. And here, the only difference with the oblate spheroid, again, you start from nearly cir near circles for a nearly spherical oblate spheroid, but as the oblate spheroid flattens out and becomes a flat disk, infinitely flat disk, you have, again, meridians, but they are orthogonal to the original meridians, okay? So, uh, so I'll just show you, so this talk is primarily going to focus on oblate spheroids for a reason that will become clear in the next couple of slides, but just to, this is the trivial spinning mode for an oblate spheroid. So remember, the shear flow is going like this, Okay, and so it just spins about its axis like a sphere would. Okay, now this is the tumbling mode. Uh, right. Okay, so now the the orientation vector is in the plane of shear. Okay, so it it tumbles. So notice that it's now moving very slowly, and then because it's aligned with the flow, and then as it loses alignment, it rapidly flips across and then again spends a lot of time in the aligned phase, flips across, and so on, okay? Now this is, so we'll be concerned with these two modes primarily, because we'll see that there is a spinning, tumbling transition that is very similar to a transition, the coil stretch transition in polymer physics, okay? <clears throat> Stable in the sense that? 
Well, no. So it depends on the factors that you have, but within the framework of this problem, it will go to a different Jeffrey orbit, something like this. So this is an intermediate Jeffrey orbit. Okay, so there are again periods where it moves very slowly, but then it comes here. It's again aligned, okay, but inclined. And then it will go back there. So that's the spherical ellipse there. Okay, so if you bump it a little, then it's gonna go to one of these orbits, okay? So just to go back, there are an infinite number of these orbits, okay? And that depends on the orientation that the spheroid starts out with. Okay, so there is the spinning mode that I, we just saw that's characterized by C equals zero. So here C is the orbit constant. So the Jeffrey orbit form a one parameter family. That parameter is the orbit constant for obvious reasons. So C equals zero is the spinning mode. C equals infinity is the tumbling mode. And you have all the intermediate Jeffrey orbits for finite values of C, okay? So that C equals infinity that's C of zero. Okay, so now uh, courtesy Jeffrey, we know how the spheroid orientation evolves in a shear flow. Now if we want to calculate the viscosity, then there is a problem. And the problem is as follows. The, the orbit constant that I just spoke about is by its very definition constant. So f when I have a Jeffrey orbit and the just pure hydrodynamics, the, the spheroid is going to stick to a particular Jeffrey orbit, okay? Now, if I want to calculate the viscosity of a suspension, unlike a sphere, I need to know the distribution of spheroid orientations. And that's because a spheroid dissipates a different amount of energy depending on its orientation, okay? An aligned spheroid doesn't affect the flow too much, but a spheroid transversely oriented to the flow does. So I need to know, loosely speaking, the number of transverse orientations as opposed to the number of aligned orientations, okay? So now the problem comes with the orientation distribution because now, because the spheroid rotates along Jeffrey orbits, I can imagine the orientation distribution as being composed of two parts. One is the distribution of orientations along a Jeffrey orbit, and the other is how many particles are, are, are there in a given Jeffrey orbit. So in other words, the distribution of orientations across Jeffrey orbits, okay? Now, that second distribution is the problem. The orientation along a Jeffrey orbit can be determined, but the orientation across Jeffrey orbits is not determined in this limit because a spheroid sticks to its own Jeffrey orbit. Okay, so if I start from an initial distribution of Jeffrey orbits, there is no physics in this purely hydrodynamic problem for a spheroid to move across Jeffrey orbits. Okay, so the initial distribution across Jeffrey orbits is preserved. Okay, so that tells me that if I try to calculate a steady state rheology, there's nothing like that because the rheology is gonna depend sensitively on what's the initial distribution of Jeffrey orbits, okay? So in other words, I have a indeterminacy in that there is no unique steady state solution. I can have a continuum of Jeffrey orbit distributions and each will lead it to its own rheology, okay? So uh, now, how to resolve this? Many people have tried this and the First couple of people who did this were uh, John Hinch and Gary Leal, okay, in the 1970s. And what they realized is that in the purely hydrodynamic limit, as we just saw, there is no communication between the different Jeffrey orbits, okay? So even a weak communication such, that, such as that of Brownian motion matters, okay? So weak Brownian motion will eventually drive a steady state equilibrium across Jeffrey orbits, okay? And that leads to a unique distribution across Jeffrey orbits. So these are the distribution as a function of C. Remember, C is the orbit constant, and they are dependent on aspect ratio, okay? So that leads to a unique steady state rheology. Brownian motion does resolve the indeterminacy. Now what we wanted to ask, the question we wanted to ask is what happens for larger particles, okay? Athermal particles, okay? So where Brownian diffusion would be too slow to matter, okay? In other words, the particles are large enough for inertia to start to matter, okay? Nonlinearities, okay? We, we were so far, I guess I didn't mention this explicitly, the spheroids so far were small enough for the Reynolds number based on the spheroid to be zero, and we are, the hydrodynamics are governed by the linear Stokes equations, 
So if you add inertia, you have a nonlinearity. And the nonlinearity can drive an irreversible drift, a convective drift, not a diffusive uh, sampling, across Jeffrey orbits. Okay? So hopefully, we'll have a convective drift across Jeffrey orbits. And there'll be a unique Jeffrey orbit that's stabilized at the expense of all others. And again, I'll have a steady state rheology. Okay? So I'm not going to show you the details of this calculation. For a prolate spheroid, you can do the calculation. And the answer is yes, regardless of the aspect ratio there is a unique Jeffrey orbit that's chosen. Okay? The interest comes for the oblate spheroids, because below a certain aspect ratio, it turns out that there are two possible Jeffrey orbit choices. Okay? So this tells you that uh, this is the plot that tells you that. So let me just take you through this. So this on the ordinate, so the abscissa is the normalized orbit constant. Okay? So c equals 0 is the spinning mode. C equals infinity there is the tumbling mode. And what I've plotted against the orbit constant is the inertial drift, okay? the drift across Jeffrey orbits. And I've uh, chosen to calculate the change in orbit constant induced in a single Jeffrey period due to inertia. Okay? So the inertia causes a, the spheroid to drift across, but the drift is very gradual. So the spheroid will follow a sp tightly spiraling trajectory. Okay? So this is like the pitch of the spiral, okay? the change, the distance traveled across Jeffrey orbits in one turn. Okay? And that's essentially the change in orbit constant induced by inertia. Now, you can see that for, uh, for the most part, this orbit constant, this change in orbit constant is negative, okay? which means that it's moving from infinity to zero due to inertia. Inertia is moving the spheroid orientation vector towards smaller orbit constants. Okay? which means that the spheroid is asymptoting to a spinning mode. Remember, c equals 0 is the spinning mode. Okay? But the interest is it doesn't remain negative all through. There is a part of the uh, unit sphere, a range of orbit constants, where it's positive. Okay? So what this really implies is that, uh, let me, okay, so this is the aspect ratio axis. I start with a sphere. Okay, this is only the oblate spheroid axis, so I decrease the aspect ratio from 1, and that, that's the flat disk there. Okay? So that, what that plot tells me is that up till an aspect ratio of 1 seventh, the drift curve is actually single sign. So here, you can see, uh, I guess I've not shown it here, but all these are curves that correspond to aspect ratio smaller than 1 seventh. So if I have a fat oblate spheroid with aspect ratio greater than 1 7, then the drift is going to be negative throughout. So it's always going to go towards the spinning mode. Okay? But if I come below 1 7, then I can spiral in either direction. Okay? So what happens uh, pictorially is that this is the oblate spheroid with an aspect ratio exactly 1 7. When there is, so these are the Jeffrey orbits. What inertia is going to do is it's going to induce a spiraling towards the spinning mode. Okay, that's c equals 0 there. For aspect ratios less than 1 7th, there is a repeller that emerges from the plane, which is c from the xy plane. Okay, that's the black curve there. It separates the unit sphere into two parts. Okay? So the part, the orientations within that black curve asymptote to the spinning mode. The orientations outside the black curve between the xy plane and the black curve go into the tumbling mode. Okay? And that black curve with decreasing aspect ratio, you can see that it gets narrower and narrower till it collapses into that vortex D axis, which means that by the time you come to a flat disk, all of the orientations are actually going towards the tumbling mode. Okay? This is kind of non-intuitive because I didn't say this, but prolate spheroids asymptote to the tumbling mode for any aspect ratio. And intuitively, you expect oblate spheroids to do the opposite. And that happens for aspect ratios greater than 1 7. But below 1 7, you have both possibilities. Okay? Now, there is, this is what leads to the problem. And the problem is this, that if I look from a near sphere to an aspect ratio of 1 7, remember, the spiraling is only in one direction. Everything goes towards the spinning mode. Okay? So I have a unique distribution. The distribution is all the spheroids are found at the spinning mode. Okay, so I have a delta function. The orientation distribution is just a delta function sitting on the spinning mode. Okay? 
Now, if I go to aspect ratios less than 1 7th, then I have bidirectional sp spiraling. Okay? So, I can have orientation distributions localized at two locations. One is the uh, spinning mode, the other is the tumbling mode. Okay? Now, the problem is this. So, I, one thing is fixed that with inertia and no Brownian motion, okay, the orientation distribution will be a delta function. Okay? So, in some sense, I resolve the indeterminacy partly. In the absence of inertia, the orientation distribution could have been anything across Jeffrey orbits. Inertia tells you that it's a combination of two delta functions. But what it doesn't resolve is how much of the orientation is there in this delta function and that. That again depends on the initial orientation distribution. And that's because if you have the repeller being at an intermediate location, really the number of orientations that are going to go towards the spinning mode are the number of orientations that were there in this region of the unit sphere okay, at the initial instant. Okay? So if your initial orientation distribution had more number of orientations within this orbit, then I'll have uh, a, viscos a different viscosity. And uh, if it's not the case, then I'll have another value for the viscosity. So in other words, even with inertia, I have not quite resolved the problem that Jeffrey found of a unique viscosity. It does depend on the initial conditions. And the dependence is via the relative amplitudes of the delta function. Okay. It's a smooth distribution. So it's on peak very strong. No, because it's Brownian, so it won't be singular. It's it's peak, so it depends on the aspect ratio. So I think for uh, very slender fibers, it's peaked strongly at the spinning mode. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, that, well, that is an option. So you can yeah. choose an initial isotropic distribution. Yeah. But you know, these are really uh, large spheroids. So it will take time to build up the isotropic. They need not be uh, isotropic at the initial instant. So it depends on, you could say, sample preparation. Okay. How, how much would uh, interactions between different functions would that uh, sort of ramp up the ideal distribution? Because you said that well, I'll come to that part right at the end. Okay. So, so, so the question again is, I have inertia, but I've not eliminated the dependence on the initial orientation distribution. So what do I do for thin oblate spheroids? So the critical aspect ratio, remember, is 1 7th. Okay? And that's not so thin, because many of the applications that I spoke about involve flakes of aspect ratios that are smaller. Okay? So uh, how do I do this? The answer is, I need stochastic orientation fluctuations. Okay? An example is rotational Brownian motion, but it could be fluctuations induced by interactions between spheroids. Okay? But because this is much easier to analyze, I'm going to be talking about this as, a, as an example of what happens. Okay? So I need stochastic orientation fluctuations, but the way in which this happens is not entirely trivial. Okay? And so we'll take a detour, because a similar problem was there in polymer physics. Okay? And so just a one slide primer on uh, dilute polymer solutions. So polymer solutions are macromolecules and at very small concentrations can have very profound effects on the rheology. Okay? And these profound effects are restricted to what are known as strong flows. Okay? So an, an example of a strong flow is an extensional flow, which is like pulling apart the polymer solution between two plates at, a, at an exponential rate. Okay? So if you do that, then... Uh, this is what the plot of the extensional viscosity versus extension rate looks like. Okay? So below a critical extension rate, which is of order the inverse longest relaxation time, the polymer is more or less in its equilibrium coil configuration. So the extensional viscosity is comparable to that of a Newtonian fluid. Okay? But beyond that extension rate, it ramps up to three to four orders of magnitude higher. And the ramping up is very sudden. Okay? So that's the solution for a model of a polymer that's a Feeney dumbbell. Okay? Uh, this is an actual experiment. This is the Newtonian fluid extension and the Troughton ratio. And that's a Boga fluid, which is like a dilute polymer solution in a very viscous solvent. Okay? So this happens only in strong flows. A weak flow like simple shear 
actually induces a very gradual shear thinning. Okay. Okay. So polymers do exhibit a very pronounced viscosity in strong flows. Okay. And like I just said, this is because the strong flows succeed in deforming that equilibrium coil configuration by an enormous amount. Okay. And you can imagine that those are the beads, and as the beads get stretched in a strong flow, the strong flow pulls them even more strongly. Okay. And eventually the restoring force isn't able to keep up and it just gets stretched the whole way. But so this is okay, this was known yeah, in the 70s. What was not known is what happens when you have hydrodynamic interactions. Okay? So remember, this is a crude model of a Feeney dumbbell where I have the hydrodynamic resistance only provided by the beads. Okay? Now, this is actually intended to model a more detailed micromechanical model like a bead rod chain or a bead spring chain. So as a bead spring chain unwinds, Okay, the configuration changes, and the effect of the flow is different because as it opens up, the, there are a greater number of beads exposed to the flow, and the ability of the flow to have a frictional handle on the molecule increases. Okay? So that is not there here, and the way to model that within a dumbbell framework is to have a variable drag. So as the dumbbell gets longer, it also has a greater amount of friction. Okay? And that's what I mean by uh, hydrodynamic interactions here. And uh, this fact was found simultaneously by John Hinch at Cambridge, and as you'll see in the next slide by Dijen, both in 1974. So the essential idea that uh, these guys said is the following. So I have an equilibrium coil configuration. Okay? If I apply a strong flow, as you already saw, if the flow exceeds a critical strength, the coil is going to unwind and become much longer in length. Okay? On the other hand, if I start from a stretched polymer configuration, okay, remember there are a huge number of beads that were in the interior of the coil, but that, that have now come to the surface. And so the flow can exert a force on each of these beads. And so this has a much greater friction. And a weaker flow can keep the polymer stretched, okay, because there are a greater number of beads for the flow to act on. So that's the key realization. So it implies that if you go from a coil to a stretched configuration, you need a strong flow to do that. But if you start from a stretched configuration initially, a much weaker flow can actually uh, keep it stretched before it jumps back to a coil configuration. So if you plot these things as a function of flow strength, you see that there is an intermediate range of flow strengths where there can be both coils and stretched polymer configurations. Okay? So in other words, the extension or the configuration is multi-valued in a certain range of flow strengths. Okay? There is hysteresis. So it actually depends on what you started out with. What's the deformation history? Okay? So uh, Dejan interpreted it very nicely as a first order phase transition. So what he did was he imagined that he would coarsen an actual detail model into a dumbbell with a variable drag. And what you can do with the variable drag dumbbell is you can extract a conformational energy. Okay? And here in this conformational energy landscape, the minima and the energy correspond to the prob most probable configurations. Okay? So I want you to focus on this plot. As I go from this plot down here, the flow strength is increasing. Okay? So at this lowest flow strength, I have a minima at when the dimensionless end-to-end -end distance is zero. That's the coil configuration. Okay? But as I keep increasing the flow strength, a second well appears, and that's very distant from the first well. That's the stretched configuration. And note that there is a range of flow strengths where I have two wells separated by what would be a very large activation energy barrier. Okay? So there is an intermediate range of flow strengths, like here, where I can have both a coil well and a stretch well. Of course, beyond a certain critical debra, the coil loses stability, and all fluctuations would lead to the stretch configuration. Okay? So this is what is known as the coil stretch hysteresis, because there is a range of flow strengths. And when I say flow strength, I mean, in dimensionless terms, what's known as the debra number. Okay? So it's the extension rate times the longest relaxation time of the polymer. Okay? So there is a range of debra numbers where I could have both coiled and stretched configurations. And if you actually determine the activation energy barrier, it's much larger than KT. 
Okay? So over typical duration of experiments, over tens of rela relaxation times, you will not observe this equilibration. So you will observe either a stretched configuration, if you have stretched the polymers in the first place, or a coil configuration. Okay? So this prediction stood for almost 30 years. And then it took, uh, sorry. You're talking about, the, sorry, this one? Yes. So I, well, so the, the ends remain, the, yeah, yeah, the, this is the so-called the yo-yo model. But it's not, the, I, don't, I didn't want to focus on that. So uh, this is an in, inessential detail. It doesn't affect, the fact that the ends are wound doesn't affect the hysteresis. Uh, right. OK, so it took 30 years for uh, Steve Chu's group uh, to actually observe the hysteresis. And this was for lambda DNA. And they had to go to really large molecular weights. Okay? And you need to do that because the hysteresis, remember, exists because of the disparity in the friction coefficients of the coil and the stretched polymers. And in order for there to be a substantial difference, you need to go to really large molecular weights. Okay? So here I've shown uh, three Debra numbers, okay? And there are, each of these curves represents a particular, uh, uh, the DNA evolving from a particular initial configuration. So at the lowest Debra number, you have the DNA evolving from an initially stretched configuration and the coil, and you see both relaxed to the coil, okay? At the intermediate Debra number, the stretch molecule doesn't relax, Oh, over what is, I think, around 30 relaxation times. Okay? The coil doesn't, so there are two possible solutions for the polymer extension at this Debra number. But if you increase the Debra number further, then uh, the coil goes to the stretch. Okay? So there's only the stretch configuration here, only the coil here, both the coil and the stretch there. Okay? And because you have this, you can extract a hysteresis loop, where this is the range of Debra numbers where depending on your initial configuration, you have both stretched polymers and coil polymers, OK? Right. So now we know that. <laughs> we'll come back. And so that does mean that we can uh, draw correspondence between the polymer case and our case. So I have a polymer coil. And I'll equate this to my spinning mode of the oblate spheroid. And I have the stretch polymer. I'll equate it to the tumbling mode. OK? This, is, I mean, this isn't sacrosanct. I could have it the other way, too. Okay? And the role of Debra number is played by the aspect ratio or the inverse aspect ratio, depending on how you map this. Okay? So it makes sense that uh, I should, the initial condition dependence that's actually observed in that case should be the case here. Okay? But that doesn't resolve the question. I've just sort of rationalized it that a similar thing has been found in polymer physics. Okay? But remember, hysteresis is a finite time phenomenon. Okay? It just is because you can't observe the sample for such a long time. Eventually, there is an equilibrium distribution, and there will be barrier hopping, and eventually there will be an equilibrium setup corresponding to that bimodal distribution that we just saw. Okay? So for shorter times, I have a coil stretch hysteresis and a similar tumbling spinning hysteresis. This is for sufficiently large molecular weight polymers. Okay? This is for oblate spheroids with aspect ratios less than 0.14. That's 1 7th. Question is, what happens for longer times? Okay? So the, I, the idea that I'm going to now develop is uh, to sort of interpret in a thermodynamic framework the tumbling spinning transition. Okay? And uh, so as I said, the hysteresis is a finite time phenomenon. And eventually, you will have a coil stretch equilibrium, which really implies a bimodal distribution. Bimodal because there are two wells at two different values of the polymer extension. Okay? Now, this sort of seems maybe obvious now, but this led to a lot of controversy in the 80s because Dijon, Hinch, and Tanner's ideas were strongly opposed by Bird okay? because he interpreted, so the, if you see, read up Dijon's article, it sort of suggests that the, there are multiple states possible at a given flow strength. Okay? But Bird argued that the 
the equation for the probability density is linear. So you cannot have multiple solutions. And if there are two solutions, there'll be an infinity of them, okay? So what Bird didn't realize and what was implicit in Dijen's description is that's a finite time phenomenon. If you wait long enough, we are talking about a bimodal equilibrium distribution, okay? So, uh, right, so there was, of course, uh, that was resolved soon because after people observed uh, these things in simulations. Uh, so as I said, how long do we wait? That's like the barrier hopping time. And so the time scale will be proportional to the exponential of the activation energy involved, okay? Uh, okay. So what happens for longer times in our case? Okay, there should be a tumbling spinning equilibrium. There will be a bimodal distribution. And remember, the bimodal distribution can be induced by any form of stochastic fluctuations. For purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume that Brownian motion, rotational Brownian motion does that, okay? Yeah. Yes, so it's a, it's a one-dimensional coarse grain description and every one-dimensional solution is an equilibrium solution. So it's, hmm? But this, it's not equilibrium in the sense of just... No, no, the full, full multi-dimensional problem is non-equilibrium, but if you can coarse grain it to this one dimension, which is the most relevant coordinate, it is like an equilibrium. It's not equilibrium, of course, okay? <clears throat> right, so for that, I have to uh, solve the equation, and remember, Things are simpler for the spheroid case because I don't have a complicated configuration like the polymer. I have only the orientation vector to worry about. So I can solve the convection diffusion or the drift diffusion equation on the unit sphere. So I have a two-dimensional orientation space, okay? And I can do this. So, so what I'm going to do here, I'm not gonna go into detail, but what you can do, remember, what really matters is the orientation distribution across Jeffrey orbits. We don't care so much about the one along it, okay? So you can integrate the degree of freedom along the Jeffrey orbit and get a drift diffusion equation only in the C coordinate, okay? And because it's one dimension, a stationary solution is an equilibrium solution, okay? So you have Brownian diffusion along uh, C, balancing both the inertial drift and the Brownian drift. Okay, so now if you solve this equation, it's quite simple. The, these chi one and chi twos are functions of aspect ratio and C. So what you can do is, there will be a Boltzmann equilibrium, like equilibrium, and so you can associate the argument of the exponential with an effective C potential, okay? And then I plotted the C potential for different, uh, so the par parameter is, the, what compares the dominance of inertial convection in orientation space to Brownian diffusion, okay? So the inertial convection scales as RE, the Brownian diffusion is order one by Peclet, so the parameter is RE times Peclet. That's the rotary Peclet number, okay? So you can see that there is a potential here, so this is for an aspect ratio, uh, let's see, we'll start from large aspect ratios, 0.14, where that black line has a well, a rather broad well, close to the spinning mode. As I now decrease the aspect ratio, there's a range of aspect ratios where the potential becomes double well, okay? Eventually, at this, the smallest aspect ratio, there's only a single well corresponding to the tumbling mode, okay? So at large aspect ratios, I have only spinning. Then I go through a double well potential regime. And then at the smallest aspect ratios, I have only tumbling, okay? So with decreasing aspect ratio, the equilibrium shifts from a spinning dominated equilibrium to a tumbling dominated equilibrium, okay? So this is the same, these are the distribution functions as functions of the orbit constant. So I'm going in order of decreasing aspect ratio as I move in the clockwise direction, okay? So that there is the spinning peak Okay, and as I go to smaller and smaller aspect ratios, I have a tumbling peak. And the, so I have a, a spinning to tumbling transition with decreasing aspect ratio, okay? So I do have a unique equilibrium, okay? If I wait for long enough. Now rotational Brownian motion might, with inertia might mean waiting for an enormously long time. 
But the idea is there are other stochastic mechanisms that will operate in the same qualitative way. Okay. Now, this also leads to an interesting rheology bit, but uh, I, I'll skip that. What I want to do is connect the final piece, which is have a phase diagram for the tumbling spinning transition. Okay? So here is the phase diagram for a standard one component system. So that's the binodal, the liquid vapor uh, coexistence region, uh, the pressure specific volume diagram. And you can have a similar diagram for the polymer physics case. Okay? So here what happens is, the inverse molecular weight plays the role of temperature. Remember, in order for the frictional coefficients of the stretched and coil configurations to differ, I needed to go to really large molecular weights. Okay? So in order to have a coil stretch coexistence that can only happen beyond a certain molecular weight or below a certain inverse molecular weight. Okay? So these are my isotherms, the constant molecular weight curves. And then below a certain uh, critical, above a certain critical molecular weight, I have a two-phase region, and I can, uh, you know, identify the binodal corresponding to the stretched and coiled configuration. Okay, so this is the fractional extension. So the fractional extension is like the specific volume. The strain rate or the Debra number is like the pressure, and the inverse molecular weight is like the temperature. Okay, so. We have come this far, so the idea is can we do the same thing for uh, the spheroid case, okay? So, so the final, so again to remind you, we made this identification of the polymer coil with the tumbling mode, the stretched polymer with the spinning mode, okay? And so I have the following three uh, pieces of the analogy. The Debra number of the extension rate for the polymer corresponds to the inverse aspect ratio. I have a range of Debra numbers where I can have both coiled and stretched configurations. I have a range of aspect ratios over which I can have both tumbling and spinning modes. Okay? The polymer extension is like the orbit constant C. The stretched configuration corresponded to a very large extension. The polymer coil corresponds to a very small one. The, similarly, the tumbling mode corresponds to C equals infinity. The spinning mode corresponds to C equals zero. The final piece here is the analog of the temperature. So I just told you that the, polymer, the inverse poly, polymer molecular weight corresponds to the temperature. Okay? And here I have Re Peclet, which governs the relative dominance of Brownian motion and inertia uh, being the inverse temperature. Okay? So it's not directly the temperature. Remember, both of these involve the shear rate also. Okay? Right. So can I build the phase diagram? Okay. So I've just labeled it the ST, the spinning tumbling phase diagram. So I start with the deterministic limit, okay. no Brownian motion. So Re Peclet is infinity. Okay. And this is the aspect ratio axis. That is the C coordinate. So the spinning mode is that, C by C plus 1 is 0. This is the T phase, the C by C plus 1 is 1. And I have increasing aspect ratio here. Okay, so if you recall, below an aspect ratio of one seventh, there were multi-valued solutions in our case. There were it could be either in a spinning mode or a tumbling mode. Okay, so this is that orbit that separates the tumbling and spinning basins. Okay, so greater than 0 0.14, I have only one of these being stable, but here I de it depends on which C I am in, and I can have both tumbling and spinning modes. Okay. So that's the deterministic picture. And now if I add Brownian motion, okay, we just saw that. Let's go back there for a moment. Right. So in this case, we saw that as the aspect ratio decreased, we went from a uh, spinning peak to a tumbling peak. And that actually happens across a critical value of about 0 0.013. Okay. Now remember, if the temperature is really 0 or Re Peclet is infinite, the smallest difference between these two, the, so the smallest difference between the two potential wells would mean that the probability entirely accumulates in one. Okay? So which means that in the deterministic limit, the zero temperature limit, I will have a discontinuous transition from spinning to tumbling at an aspect ratio of 0 0.0126. Okay? So which means that my t equals 0 isotherm will be like that. So I move along the spinning phase 
for all aspect ratios until I approach a critical value of 0 0.0126 and then I must discontinuously transit to the tumbling phase. Okay, remember, it's an equilibrium phase diagram, so I've waited for a time long enough for that transition to happen. So it's longer than the longest barrier hopping time. Okay? Right. So now I can add the finite temperature isotherms, which would mean different values of Re Peclet. Okay? And uh, Re Peclet actually increases in that direction. So this is uh, T equals infinity at, in some sense, zero temperature isotherm and I uh, increase Re Peclet here. The interesting thing here is that I can actually locate the zero temperature curve, okay? And uh, then what I do is construct the tie lines, okay? I, I know what the potential energy is. I know the aspect ratio at which the minima are equal, and I draw the tie lines there, and I can begin to identify the points that correspond to the two-phase coexistence, and I can connect them Okay, so remember I have a finite two-phase existence region here. It's terminated by that. This part is not thermodynamically accessible. Okay, so, uh, so this is the speculated uh, phase diagram. And I have the analog of the critical isotherm where the multivaluedness just ceases. Okay, that will be at a critical aspect ratio and there is a detailed condition involved on our averaged analysis being valid here. It becomes more complicated in another limit, but you don't expect this qualitative thing to change. And now if I do the actual calculation, uh, it turns out more or less like that, okay? So that's, uh, you go in decreasing Re Peclet, so that's the largest Re Peclet there, the black line, and the magenta line there is the uh, T equals zero curve, okay? Okay, so, that's the last part. So this sort of completes the analogy with the coil stretch phase diagram. Okay, so now there are several directions in which we can start to look at this problem. One is that uh, the closed orbits or the Jeffrey-like orbits are not unique to simple shear flow, which is the flow I considered. They persist over a range of planar linear flows. And in all these linear flows, you expect hysteretic dynamics for oblate spheroids over a certain range of aspect ratios, pending calculation, okay? Uh, so this is like this. So you, if you can plot the, the vertical axis here, denotes the type of linear flow. So you can go from solid body rotation here to the pure extensional flow here, okay? So there is a range of flows as indicated by the shaded region where you have closed orbits. And that line there separating the two kinds of flows is simple shear. Right, and planar linear flows have been employed before by, for instance, Gary Leal to study drop coalescence, and Chu, who has looked at polymer uh, uh, extension fluctuations in mixed flows. Right, so another question is, what we found was within the range of a theoretical analysis which is restricted to very small Reynolds number. So if I plot the oblate aspect ratio, critical aspect ratio, separating hysteretic dynamics from non-hysteretic ones, okay? Uh, then we have really located a point here, which is one-seventh. The critical aspect ratio when Reynolds is very small, so how does one uh, extend that curve up, okay? You need simulations, okay? Uh, the other thing, the second thing is more important. The thermal fluctuation here analyzed was uh, an example, okay? But we know that as spheroids get large enough for inertial forces to be important, really Brownian motion will be a very, very slow process, okay? So what we are more interested in is hydrodynamic, hydrodynamically induced orientation fluctuations replacing thermal ones, okay? And uh, in order to think about this, you could think about the fact that I am now, the spheroid suspension is at a finite volume fraction, and so they'll invariably be pair interactions, okay? So I have a spheroid rotating along a Jeffrey orbit. I have a second spheroid interacting with it. And at the end of the interaction, the spheroid has jumped to a different Jeffrey orbit. And I have repeated such uncorrelated pair interactions, so it will lead to a, eventually a steady state distribution. Okay, the only problem is, of course, this is very, very complicated to do theoretically. It's not a diffusive process. It's a non-local jump in orientation. 
and you need to solve the pair problem to be able to solve this. Okay. Uh, the idea is, so uh, now another question is, we have analyzed inertia and Brownian motion, which are incompatible, but viscoelasticity and Brownian motion aren't. So can viscoelasticity induce a drift similar to this? Okay. Uh, the other thing is oscillatory shear. How does oscillatory shear change the uh, dynamics across Jeffy orbits? So, yeah, I think, yeah, this is a good place to end. Thank you. <clears throat> Said that uh, both the tumbling and the spinning dynamics are possible, right? So, uh, you, if you fix the aspect ratio to one value below one seventh, and you change the shear rate, uh, do you see a transition from one uh, dynamical state to the other? With as a function of the shear rate, I mean. Well, within the framework of the analysis that I spoke about, that won't happen. Mm -hmm. But if you, so if you increase the Reynolds number, that's mm -hmm. likely to happen. Mm -hmm. You will shift that location of the repeller as a function of Reynolds. So that's going to happen, but you need to do it at finite Reynolds numbers to mm -hmm. uh, see that. So right here, the location of the repeller is independent of the shear rate. It stays at a, it's only a function of the aspect ratio. Okay, but you will observe that, but you probably need to do a simulation to see that. So in a simulation or in an experiment, if you ramp up the shear rate, that will happen. Okay, in the low Reynolds number theory, that ingredient is not there. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's been calculated by Jeffrey, um, well, uh, 93 years back, maybe. So. It scales with the aspect ratio. So it increases, so it's proportional to the aspect ratio for thin prolate spheroids and inversely proportional to the aspect ratio for thin oblate spheroids. So the time basically grows. The more elongated a particle or the flatter a particle gets, the longer it takes to uh, go through a full rotation. Uh, so uh, you have a analogy with the fast order transition. <coughs> So, um, in fast order transition, you have some an, some free energy to uh, which system tries to minimize. So, what will be analogous here? This one. U of C is the free energy that I'm minimizing. So, what physically it is? <coughs> it physically is nothing. <laughs> It's not a free energy. It's just that the equation turns out that you can interpret it as like an energy like. It's certainly not a thermodynamically significant thing. The exponential of whatever is the problem. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, in a Brownian diffusion limit or at a very low shear rate, if you have a system of uh, particles highly anisotropic particles or different types of particles. So <coughs> can you use Einstein equation in that regime or not? So what do you mean by the Einstein equation? So Einstein equation for, uh, uh, for viscosity <coughs> dependent on volume fraction. So the first equation is sold. Yeah. So, so what will happen to this equation uh, for highly anisotropic particles? It's, it's, it's uh, only value very sphere. low shear rate. It's only valid for spheres at low shear rates. Anisotropic particles would be like this. Okay, so the remaining slides are but all what would happen for. Uh, yeah. Okay, but very at low shear rate, your uh, Brownian motion will be dominant. So in that case, it will just uh, randomize uh, your safe information, right? Yes, yes, it would, but that's not very. So we know for small enough spher uh, spheroids the distribution will be nearly isotropic, but it's not very interesting. So you want to make it larger and see what's the departure from isotropy. Because isotropic would mean that the rheology is Newtonian. Yeah. So you want to look at the non-Newtonian effects of the suspended quantities. <coughs>
With regards to the initial distribution of Jeffrey orbits, can uh, polydispersity in particle size sort of play a role <coughs> in the well, so spread in the aspect? It's a good question. Ratio? No, it, so the short answer is no. The Jeffrey orbit distribution will not change due to polydispersity. But the orientation distribution within a Jeffrey orbit crucially relies on polydispersity. So I told that it is determined, but in principle, even that is not determined in the purely convective limit. Okay? But if you add a tiny amount of polydispersity, then the distribution within an orbit is determined. But across the orbits, no. R regardless of their aspect ratio, each one is stuck to their Jeffrey orbit. So. Yes, suspending fluid, yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? There's one, maybe one last question from there, and then. I can't hear you. Can you yeah. speak up a little bit? If you have a deformable, uh, like droplet kind of thing in uh, another suspending medium, which uh, so uh, the shape is deformable now, right? So now uh, yeah. is the scenario going to change a lot or what? Well, short, I don't know. <laughs> You'll have to do it. So there's no way of s telling this. So it, I think it might depend on the details. So you would never have known why is 1 7th so special. You, know, you had to do the calculation to find it out. So uh, if you neglect the uh, interactions, hydrodynamic interactions between the different spheroids, so you have a lot, a lot of spheroids uh, in a suspension, and you give a certain uh, shear to it. And uh, your uh, aspect ratio is, again, in that regime where you see both the dynamics possible. <coughs> so uh, what, what will you possibly see? The, each spheroid will have, its, uh, will have a different uh, different what should I say, tumbling or spinning mode? Or will they all have the same mode? <clears throat> well, the fraction of spheroids that you start within that repelling orbit will have a spinning mode. The fraction outside will have the tumbling mode. So if you can, it depends on the, par the part of the initial orientation distribution that lies within the repeller and outside. So the part of the initial orientation distribution within the repeller will squeeze into a delta function at the spinning mode. The part outside will squeeze into a delta function at the tumbling mode. So you will have two delta functions. But the amplitude of those delta functions will be dependent on the particular initial, initial distribution. Hmm? They are not, which is why this would happen, yeah. And if you have Brownian motion, you would expect them to really jumble up. Jumbled up, it, it would be the exponential, yeah, I, I negative mean, I, exponential of U of C. The <laughs> amplitudes of those uh, delta functions. Well, that, so that is it's a good. So that is the obvious part. Okay, the mm -hmm. delta functions is going to be smoothened on an accessible time scale. What is going to take much much longer is for the probability to leak from one delta function to the other delta function. That will happen on a time scale which is like the exponential of Reynolds times Speckle, which will be very, very large. Okay. So it's a two time scale thing. First, you'll have almost quasi-steady peaks of probability set up at the tumbling and spinning location. But then there'll be a, a transport of probability from one peak to the other. Thank you. <laughs>